Hey everyone. All right, so according to my phone, we go into Mercury retrograde in like 30 minutes. <laughs> so we're right there. It's pretty much stationing at that pivot point. All right, hi everyone. So today we're talking about Mars and healthy masculinity. Um, a little story about the Aries energy right now. So I'm, I'm driving. I was actually listening to some of the Zoom meetings before, um, as long as reception allowed me to listen while I was driving. And I get to a point where my iPhone says something like, um, to go to where I'm, where, I'm, where I'm going, make a right on 90 South towards Kingman. And then I look at the street sign and it says 90 North Kingman. And it was so disorienting, and I had a, my, my in, impulse immediately was to just follow my phone's instructions, because that's kind of how unchecked Aries consciousness goes. It just goes in the direction that it's going. It's not stopping. And it actually feels threatened if there's something external saying wrong way. <laughs> but I stopped, and I was like, hmm, this is interesting. Just before Mercury goes retrograde, I'm trying to get here in time for a class. And I determined definitely that there was a discrepancy between my phone and the sign. And that what I did was I just looked at the map with my eyes and my own mind. And I looked where the, you know, where the lines were going. And then I looked out on the road and I determined logically which exit was the correct exit according to where it was moving. And so this is a great example of uh, Mercury going retrograde in Aries because Mercury in Aries, the shadow of that could be just staying in motion, just being in movement. And then Mercury, as we all know, corresponds to how we organize reality in our mind. And this is a great example of how retrograde can actually be a great time, not necessarily where all things go crazy, but we have to stop sometimes. And it's where we have a conditioning pattern to just stay in motion and expect things to be the way they always are. That's where mistakes are made. That's where things fall apart. So Mercury in Aries is not just plowing forward. It's thinking. It's independent thought. Aries, Mercury. And that's that warrior quality of Aries. I'm going to stop and look and assess the battlefield I'm not going to rely on something that I don't have actual control and sovereign over. So that's a good segue into this Aries talk. Unchecked, Aries energy just goes and goes and goes. And I want to pull up a um, simple zodiac wheel. Um, let's see if this is it. Yeah. So can everyone see this? Yeah, you can see it. Let me just make it so it's more centered. Just a basic zodiac wheel. Um, but look at the glyph for Mars. Draw a circle. Boom. Notice how it's an arrow coming out of a circle. Try to balance that, right? Like try to stay balanced when you're this forward moving fiery energy on top of a circle. And if you understand how that works, if you've ever, you know, ridden a bicycle or a unicycle, you have to keep on moving for it to stay centered, for it to stay balanced. So you can think poetically of this Mars energy. It's coming from, it's after Pisces, it's after Neptune. And that's the cosmic wholeness. It's our eternal home. It's the foundation of truth and peace in this present moment. It's where we belong. And we have this impulse within consciousness in a way to hold this notion of, yes, but there's also all of this. I want to do something. I'm going for something. There's something that's wanting to unfold. Really, Mars is that evolutionary impulse. It's what carries the evolutionary journey of the soul forward in time. So there's this experience of leaving this primordial oneness and unity and moving in some kind of direction towards 
something that's never been experienced before. And there's an inherent anxiety there. There's no perspective. There's just the need, and it's a need to stay in motion, to be moving. And what happens if that energy stops moving? It falls, right? There's, there's nothing more difficult than stagnating that powerful, impulsive energy within us that actually needs to stay in motion. But there's no inherent perspective. And this is where I want to use the zodiac wheel to really exemplify some of the core aspects of Mars. We can do this by looking at the relationship of Aries to the entire zodiac. So think of Aries itself as pure energy. And we can define Aries Mars archetype as, you know, Jeff Green says it really beautifully, it's a lower octave of Pluto. It represents the actions, the choices we're consciously making in our life that sets forward the evolutionary journey. It sets things in action. You make a choice, you're going to find out what happens after that, and it opens up an entirely new path. With Aries, we're stepping forward into something that will bring us into a completely new terrain of life experience and teach us. Now, we have the square between Aries and Capricorn, and that says, while you're acting, while you're using your energy, be ethical. And what that means is there are other people, there's society. The actions you take will have an effect on your body, <laughs> on yourself, on your future, on what you're trying to build and establish. Be mindful, be thoughtful, go slow, Capricorn. And I didn't even think of this while I was preparing or when I chose this talk. But right now, we have a very strong Aries Capricorn thing going on. So Mars is with the Sun and Aries, and they're all moving to a square with Saturn in Capricorn. So this is in the collective right now. It's just a lot of energy, but Capricorn mastering that energy, learning how to consciously wield it, not just being um, a victim to our impulses. Then we have Cancer, which is gentle. It's the emotional body. It asks us to nurture and care for our foundations, our roots. You can think of the relationship between the child that wants to separate and have their independence, but then also needs to run back to their mother. Needs to feel safe, needs to feel protected, needs to feel secure. Then if we're just running and running and running and moving, we're going to burn our house down. So we learn respect for the yin. And then we have Libra which is simply the general symbology of you're not the only one there, all right? So you're acting, you're moving, but then you might hurt someone or someone might hurt you. Altogether, what this does is it takes this raw energy of Aries, which is just like, and it, it says, nope, 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 nope. It's like, ah, where do I act? What, where do I, what do I do with this energy? So the whole reality of pretty much the rest of life, everything else but you, the whole cosmos, every other person, is in a way reflecting back to that raw Mars energy within us. It's helping it create refined direction that's in harmony with life. And we develop intelligence in that Mars energy. That intelligence, and basically Mars equals stupid. And I don't say that in a derogatory way, just like in the literal definition of it. It's actions or ways of being that aren't thoughtful. And that's normal but we develop a really refined intelligence with our Mars energy, and it happens through the reflection of life itself. So if we're willing to embrace the experience of our freedom and our need for motion, which is necessary, being blocked, seeming to hit up against a wall time and time and time again, it invites the skill of stillness and stopping. And that's what I did today when I was driving, and I'm proud of myself for that. I, I sense the possibility of, of falling into a trap, <laughs> of just going where my mind was thinking I was supposed to go. But we develop that because, well, I've done that many times, where I'm just going and going and going, and not following this more subtle impulse that says, maybe you should stop. You could also look at the relationship between Aries and Virgo. It's a 
gibbous phase in conjunct, 150 degrees, or from your perspective, 150 degrees. And that basically says, once you start acting, there's a possibility of making a mistake. And that can be terrifying. Basically, you're disrupting the status quo. Mars is inherently destructive. It's not keeping things in balance. So once you start something in motion, you can't undo it. So it brings up that Virgo energy of potential messiness. There might be a mess to clean up, or you may have to correct yourself and long, learn along the way. And it's an inconjunct. You can't think yourself. You have to just do it and learn along the way. And then the full phase, which is social, in conjunct, 210 degrees with Scorpio, that's shit. What am I, what am I committing to? I, 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 I just had sex with this person. What is this opening up now? What did I just do? I just you know, enrolled and invested all of my money in this course. Uh-oh. What have I signed? You know, what kind of contract have I signed? You know, we're, we're choosing things, but that is going to take us deeper, perhaps into a world where we have no control over things. We're going to face our deepest fears, our deepest insecurities. Things will come up and it'll be scary. We'll face our shadow. So that's, and again, you can't think about these things. You have to just act and life will bring up what it needs to bring up. <clears throat> And this brings me to another important piece around the Mars energy. It's this archetype called decisiveness. So relative to that impulse of, in, I really want to offer this way of thinking of it as a fire that's burning. The fire will not go out. It's there for the entire incarnation. It, and there's a need in order for us to feel like we're consciously engaging with our life and our life's purpose, our own evolutionary potential. There's a need for all of us to feel a certain degree of sovereignty in our choice making. Like I can choose, I can respond consciously to my circumstances. And so thus there's an archetype of decisiveness that is necessary and inherent to the Mars energy. And decisiveness brings our power out. There's this beautiful quote. I didn't have the time to, to bring it up, but it's by Goti. Goth, I don't know how to say this person's name. I, I keep on forgetting to find out. Maybe one of you can help me. But it's something about until you make the choice, the cosmos can't move with you. But there's something that happens where divine providence becomes available life actually can meet us and begin opening things we couldn't have thought of when we make that choice, when we decide this is what I'm doing, this is where I'm going. And the complex within all of us can orient in all different kinds of ways. So I have Mars in Libra in the first house. Actually, Saturn squaring my Mars right now, like to like exact, maybe it's exact tomorrow or something like that. So... For me, this is very much about relationship. Mars and Libra in the first house, I might instinctively initiate relationship, really be drawn or really be drawn to communicate. And what's the issue with Mars and Libra when it comes to just quick action? I'm, I care very much about balance and harmony. I care about fairness. I care about everyone being treated in a way that is respectful and right for them. I care about the energy of balance and harmony. And so, a karma that I'm facing during this transit is where there might be a tendency to play the role of arbitrator because of a need to create balance and harmony in my own life. And so then initiating relationships as well, where I might be playing that role for other people. And so this journey for me in understanding a more conscious use of my own masculine energy, which can very much be oriented towards you know, being the defender and the protector. But that makes me aware, this is how I'm using my fire. This is how I'm using my life force. So by stopping and watching the areas of life that I'm otherwise inclined to do something about, it actually makes me more aware of a greater state of balance and harmony. And it actually makes me become more mindful of 
how can I take my time and communicate in ways where I'm actually building intimacy and understanding and relationship? Because the unconscious impulse would be just to jump in and say something, just to get involved. And that will usually create strong reactions in my environment. So the gift, and this is something that I'm cultivating right now with the Saturn transit, it's necessary. The gift is to really touch base with that energy of non-harmony, the energy of out of balance. Instead of just acting or saying something, which, you know, when with Mars and Libra, especially in the first house, if I'm taking that role of, I'm going to make sure everyone is getting a fair treatment, it'll put a lot of people off. People will feel put up upon and get defensive. And I've noticed that. So to take my time and actually connect with that energy of harmony and balance and to connect with what are my needs, what do I want to express, what's true for me that I want to communicate. My Mars is sextile, my Sagittarius sun. So again, that could also be a very loud and boisterous and almost self-righteous. This is what I know. This is the truth. I have the answer. Sextile is harmonious, but it, the, the issue with the sextile is, you know, it's easy to just kind of let your energy out, to not cultivate great self-awareness. So to take my time and, f so to give an example, I emailed someone and I said, hey, this is what I'm noticing and feeling that's been coming up for me. I want to know what's been happening for you. And that was good for me because the Mars and Libra impulse would have been to just, you know, come out there and say something without really taking the time. So again, that Libra, Cancer, Capricorn, Grand Cross really teaches us how to not just rush with that energy. So being decisive means, yes, I can make choices. I'm able to respond and stay moving, but consciously. Whereas indecision is one of the most difficult energies for Mars. And of course, indecision as an archetype is actually a Libra thing. So to have Mars in Libra, I think this is why in traditional astrology, they've talked about um, Mars. I think, I don't, I don't know what the word is. I don't really think in those ways, but the fall or detriment in Libra. I understand why they would say that because Libra inherently orients towards, well, what do you think? What do you want? Or it can get so caught up in projecting into well, what would happen if I said this, how would they feel about that? So to fall into a state of indecision with Mars anywhere, it's like that, that wheel falling and energy gets depressed, energy gets lost, it's drained, it's exhausted. And if you ever met a very, a very, very strong Aries kind of person who has a lot of Aries energy, if you've ever noticed what it's like for them when they're not doing something, when they're not moving, when they're not generating energy. It's actually very possible for these souls to fall into substance abuse or to gravitate towards very extreme, um, high intensity kinds of experiences. Cause it's a way of them connecting with that part of themselves that needs to feel like they're moving, needs to feel like they're at the edge of some kind of experience, but there isn't necessarily any growth in that. So we could have souls that actually have a very strong masculine appearance and, you know, male or female, any gender, who are very much into aggression and always doing, always accomplishing or, you know, getting stronger and stronger and stronger and just, but they're not necessarily, and they can even be successful at that. They can be doing a lot and always initiating. But if you look keenly and you really tune into their own karmic reality, it's not necessarily a sign of growth. This is oftentimes what a soul will turn to because at the core, they feel a deep fear of really taking charge of their life. They, they feel a deep fear of acting and making the choices that are really calling to them. And so there's a way, and this is another way of understanding the Mars relationship to Virgo, right? Virgo can procrastinate and put things off forever and forever. But that Mars energy that needs something to be doing it can just focus its entire life on lifting weights. And there's a sense of, yeah, I'm building, I'm accomplishing something, I'm getting stronger, I'm moving, I'm connecting with it. Mm. But that might also be a distraction. So <clears throat> what I want to talk a little bit about before we open up to volunteers is sexuality and just 
the energy of masculinity. And of course, when I speak about this, I'm not speaking about men in particular, but of course, the energies that I'm going to be speaking to have a lot to do with in the collective male female dynamics but on the level of consciousness you know male female dynamics within heterosexual contexts but within the consciousness of the collective this is about coming into alignment with healthy masculine sexuality healthy masculine energy and it starts off by noticing and acknowledging first and foremost in the world we have been out of balance completely out of balance with that yang impulse and a basic example of that is simply how there is almost a judgment, a judgment and a fear and a shame when it comes to not knowing what to do, when it comes to the need for rest, for slowness. It's a deeply held insecurity in the collective. And so when we're tired, we take caffeine, which stresses the adrenaline. When we don't know what to do, we go into thought and excessive moving, moving yang energy, right? We fire up the, the energy within ourselves to find direction. It is more rare to find amongst people a conditioned orientation towards slowing down towards stopping, towards connecting with the framework and the fabric of one's life. Something that I've been practicing because I drive a lot and sometimes I'll get tired is literally stopping the second I feel tired and just closing my eyes, just resting for a few moments. And that's an important part of Aries because we're doing and we're moving and we're moving. And if we don't know how to stop and integrate and come back we will burn ourselves out and that's what pretty much is what's happening in the world for a long time and the way we related to the feminine to women and to our own bodies it's been a way of taking using degrading not respecting and so there's been an underlying impulse within collective consciousness that I need to take and I need to move. And the life around me is a resistance. It's a interference to where I'm trying to go. Thus listening, taking my time, building, connecting, using that yang energy in the way of respect and connection and listening. Court, from the point of view of that pure yang conditioned patriarchal consciousness, I'm not going to go that slow. I have things to do or I have needs that I want. I once worked with a man who has a stellium of planets in Capricorn in the first house, Sagittarius and Capricorn in the first house. And um, I won't go into the story, but one of the things that came up, basically a lot of people, in particular women, have been confronting him around his aggressive sexual energy and how he's been projecting that and one of the things he said to me was you know if i'm dancing and i'm just in my pure consciousness zone and there's someone in the way you know they should just get out and create some space i'm not trying to hurt them and that's a great example of that adolescent non-matured masculine energy because in a way masculine energy is pure consciousness it's not about the fluid dance it's about the singular single focus nature of consciousness itself. It's only this moment. It's only I'm going, I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving. It's single focused. And so even meditation, for example, can be a beautiful expression of that Mars masculine consciousness. Single focus attention on now. But if that's not matured, and this is a thing even in spirituality, and this is one of my biggest you know, learnings in this lifetime, and I'm so passionate, about bringing this teaching out because I think it's so important for the collective. Even in spirituality, there's been a deep disrespect and shaming of the feminine, of the yin, where in many spiritual practices, there's the teaching, separate yourself from the world, separate yourself from interference, 
and create an environment that is conducive to deep inner stillness and contemplation, single focused, very masculine, very Mars, right? So that there's nothing getting in your way. But what's happened, and there's beauty in knowing how to create that space for oneself, but it's not the whole teaching, right? There's more to the spiritual growth, to the spiritual journey. And so what's happened, what's been communicated and believed is the outer world, the dance with life, the dance with the earth, the dance with the body, the dance with the feminine, the dance with the relationship gets in the way. It's interfering. And so there hasn't been adequate, in my opinion, my perception, there hasn't been adequate respect and appreciation for really bringing that healthy masculine energy of choice making, decisiveness, consciousness, attention into the full sphere of our human life. So we have very spiritually oriented people who are totally dysfunctional in relationship and don't know a thing about how to use their own sexual energy, their own desire, their own impulses, which is very much a Mars thing in a healthy and balanced and respectful way. And this is again where we can really take the polarity of Libra. Libra rules the heart chakra. So the teaching within that Mars energy is by tuning into the heart space, we are not abandoning our journey. We're not taking away from our forward motion. Rather, we're creating the possibility for forward motion that is actually in harmony with life because Mars is destructive. And that's the thing about masculine energy. It is destructive. So the other side to all of this is in the collective, and understandably so, in particular with men, there is immense shame and guilt and insecurity around that Mars Ying energy because it has been misused. That energy has been unconsciously used to rape, pilgrimage, hurt, abandon, betray, run away from. It's like in and out. And so around monks more and more conscious men, but in general, in the collective, around our awareness of our masculine energy, how we use it in the collective, there is a growing awareness of, oh, I don't want to hurt with it. I don't want to do something that is violating. I don't want to cross boundaries. And so there's a piece, there's a growth piece, and this is, you know, very much up right now as well in the collective, of claiming that fiery, destructive energy you know, it, it's that energy that kills, it destroys. Whenever we consciously use that Mars energy, there's no going back. We are disrupting the status quo and fully showing up with all of our life force. And that changes the environment around us. That's why Mars is a leader, because it's moving forward and it's giving all of itself. It's not looking back. It's right here, right now. So to claim that energy, let me find the right words for this. Means there's a journey and a necessity to develop confidence and trust in one's power. Because we have not known that we are sovereign over this energy. It does not control us. But if we have not known our own sovereignty, that we are in control and we are consciously using this impulse, then we will see it as a potentially painful and hurtful and invasive energy. But to cultivate knowledge of this power is something that we are consciously using is so important. So this is very real for sexual energy, for that masculine sexual energy. It is a conscious choice how it's being used, which means the impulses, the drive is not just something to give into, but nor is it something to suppress. That's the thing. It's like, this is too much. I need to push it away or not hurt with it or just give into it. There's a place, and this is a part of the awakening where you can really think of Mars as the lower octave of Pluto. Pluto is Kundalini. 
And Pluto is choice making on the level of cooperation or resistance to evolution. Right? It's like evolve or don't evolve. There is in the energy of Pluto a pushing and a giving oneself in entirety to evolution in the same way that a butterfly pushes its wings, right? To get out of the chrysalis. So when, when we claim our sovereignty over our choices, over how we use our power, it's like me stopping on the road and saying, okay, I don't believe that it's my destiny or fate or purpose to get lost and drive down a road that I've driven many times before and go in the wrong way. I'm going to stop and center and consciously direct my mind, Mercury and Aries. Think for myself, actually look at the map, actually look at the road in front of me. And we can apply this to sexuality, to any kind of intimacy, any way that we're using our and I mean, Sexuality is like the greatest metaphor for understanding everything in our life. And we can talk a lot about that. But just to think of this in our life in general, we don't have to just go and go and go, nor do we have to think that we can't make choices. So that's one of the things that I really try to tune into the most when I work with people and this Mars energy comes up. And I especially love doing this with men. This is obviously a big part of my own journey. It's a part of the journey of the masculine itself in its entirety. So I'm learning these things that I'm very passionate It's very important to me, and I have a lot of passion and a strong calling to speak more about these matters and actually to be working with more men and addressing these areas of really claiming and using our own masculine energy in a conscious way. Because there's so, and that the, the energy of shame is represented by that square between Mars, uh, Aries, and Capricorn, which really beautifully speaks to like, I've acted out of alignment. I feel like shit about that. I don't deserve anything. I deserve to be punished. I don't trust myself. And Capricorn's authority. So cultivating confidence in ourselves is absolutely necessary. And this is a great theme right now in particular with the sun and Mars coming together, squaring Saturn, and then squaring Pluto. So this is a great time to really look at how are we making choices, right? And we can feel disempowered or we can feel like that Mars. So for a lot of people, and this can be in particular with women, but not necessarily, we have where the energy of that strong invasive masculine energy feels like it's constantly imposing itself and trying to take, right? And thus there can be a repressed anger. Again, Capricorn Aries, it's not okay for me to be angry. It's not okay for me to express myself. It's not polite. There's so much conditioning around that in particular to, for women. So there can be a lot of anger. And when that anger is repressed, it tends to always show up as an outer event. So being able to claim the no, being able to claim this is what I want, this is my yes, or to claim this is what I want, this is my attraction, this is my interest, this is what I'm drawn to, this is who I'm drawn to. This is a really great time in the collective. It's like for the next month because it'll square Pluto and then all this Aries, you know, Mars will then conjunct Uranus. It's opening up all this energy. So what we liberate within ourselves, our own empowered connection to that yin energy is so helpful. It's a great time to be working on this. Okay, so um, let's spend the rest of the time answering questions and looking at charts. I want to, before, we, before I look at any of the individual volunteer charts, I just want to open up for questions in general first to see if that's there, and then we'll go into individual charts. And I'm Hi. Gonna... Yes. Hi, this is Patrice. Uh, excellent so far. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question. I have a, a person in my life that has um, quite a bit of the, uh, you sort of addressed it. He's got three planets in the first house uh, in Virgo. He's a, um, he's a first house Pluto. And um, <clears throat> I heard you say about Aries, um, you know, in the, the in conjunct with Virgo and how that a lot of times brings in the, the fear. Um, 
I, could you speak a little bit to um, the complex that I'm familiar with is, is like a castration syndrome where there's a failure to initiate. Mm -hmm. and, and I wondered if you could speak castration. a little bit to that. Yeah, totally. And I can speak to it because I have a Virgo ascendant. Uh -huh. There's my nodes. Um, so big part of my journey has been, and it's still, of course, manifesting on levels, a devastating fear to step forward. So projects, what my soul has been calling for, I've put things off for years before actually doing it. And it, it oftentimes corresponds to a guilt. If we've acted hastily in the past, and I can speak from my own life and from what I've come to understand about past lives, where I've acted, where I've attested knowledge and skill that I didn't have. And thus I've made mistakes, which has created a permeating and devastating fear of acting upon what I actually do know. But the humility that I've learned along that journey is, okay, I have something to act upon. I can do something. And what I'm learning is to just really check in with what's actually in my abilities, what's actually in my field of knowledge, and to do that. So it teaches humility. And if we can get to the point where we acknowledge the lesson, so to speak, and we realize there's no big deal, there's, it's like it's, there's darn flashing lights. It's just do your work and move on. And when we get to that point, it's just, oh, okay, yeah. And the issue was I was trying to do someone else's work. You know, for me, Sagittarius, adopting ideas and beliefs and trying to fit into something that I thought was great and I wanted to, but I wasn't. And all the while, missing out on my actual indigenous wisdom, like who I really am. So when we come to terms with who we are, no big deal. We can just act. So if, for this individual, I don't know his journey, there would be something around getting out of the whole complexity of what he might think it means to act and to actually look at what am I called to, what's in front of me, and to just do it. Great. Um, that, that's helpful. One, one little um, more thing with that, and I think this fits into what you said too, is that he is a Scorpio son, and you did address, um, and he also has the Virgo on the Ascendant too. And you did address um, the, the fuel, you know, the, uh, the Scorpio in conjunct too, and how that is, there's more of the, um, you know, I'm either going forward is what I heard. Could you speak just a little bit more to that Scorpio Aries um, complex too, you know? Yeah. I think that fits in. Yeah. Uh, so not, not to him in particular, I don't know his chart, but just in general. When we do something, we're opening up the door for things that we are not going to be able to control. So, for example, we might find we become attached to someone. We become possessive, or they become possessive, or they become attached. You know, Scorpio on one level is where we end up courting people, but it's also where we got to disentangle our energy, courting things, courting identities. We have to keep it disentangled so that energy can move freely. And yet, within Scorpio, we also have the archetype of making commitments. Right? I'm going to see this thing out with you. I'm going to fully evolve. But when our commitment to something or someone becomes an entrapment, we're no longer making choices. We're just hooked into a pattern of obsession or compulsion or fear or addiction. But when our commitment is in the foundation of it, about soul growth, then we're consciously choosing to be there. We're consciously choosing to be present for what arises, for what shows up. We're gonna do our work. So that's the relationship between Aries and Scorpio. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Yeah, so with Pluto in the first house, that encapsulates that archetype, and then we have the Scorpio sun, which you know, even, even intensifies it. So there can be a total fear of commitment with that kind of signature, for sure. And I'm not speaking to him, but just in general. <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at some, some of the volunteer charts. And I invite those who offer their charts to speak about, to keep it on this topic, but you know, speak whatever's true for you. Um, so Barbara's the first chart that I have up here. I'm gonna share the screen. Barbara, are you here? There you are. Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, let me get the screen share going on. Okay. 
So we got Mars in the 10th house in Aquarius. And lots of other things. Okay. What's up? Um, you know, when you were asking for questions, I was kind of wondering if there's any markers that you look at or when you're kind of grokking the chart in general to see about the balance between masculine and feminine, yin and yang. I mean, I just, you know, are there certain things that stand out like, oh, this problem, this, there's a problem, someone's too dominant masculine or, I mean, that sounds like a judgment, but I mean, I guess you look at the Venus Mars relationship, um, you know, the placement, just in general, like, Okay, I'll ask something specific to my chart. Is I have Pallas Athena conjunct my mm. son, which mm -hmm. is kind of a father's daughter, you know. And, and I am a Sagittarius, and I was a tomboy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Speak to that at all, or? Sure. I mean, it's very much an intuitive synthesis of so many things. Um, for example, Pallas Athena conjunct the sun is very masculine energy. Um, you know, it's it's going to be very, it's a very intuitive signature. Right, that's someone that can really uh, see the larger picture and have deeper thoughts and just bring things out in the world in a very creative and very strong-willed, independent way. Especially in the eighth house, which isn't masculine, but really the eighth house is depth. So anything in the eighth house gets deep. Um, in terms of understanding, like if there might be an imbalance, you'd really just have to see. For example, does Mars square the nodes? Is there a bunch of, you know, retrograde planets in Virgo in the first house? In which case, I might say there's not an imbalance. There's maybe a deficiency. Um, and the masculine feminine thing is more than just Aries, um, Mars, Venus. It's also Aries, Libra. And also the fourth house is the essence of yin. The tenth house isn't necessarily masculine. But because of the roles we play in this world, and how we relate to structure and society, there is a quality within the 10,000 of how we're structuring our identity within life. And, you know, it's a very common EA teaching that strong 10th house, 4th house things can have a very strong fluidity in terms of gender or gender switching. You could have a soul with lots of 10th house planets, and they might have an orientation towards accomplishing and building and succeeding, but they're repressing their yin. Um, yeah, there, there are all kinds of ways of, and there could also be a soul that has very, very strong masculine signatures, but feels guilt about it, right? You could have, a, you know, Mars, you know, trining Saturn wherever it's placed, and that's actually a very strong signature for getting shit done, doing things, but there can be also a guilt for where there's been an arrogance so that trying to be arrogant and not really paying attention to other people and thus it might that soul might develop a humility it might be at times during more introspective periods of their life where they're healing and integrating they might be afraid to act and anyway, did that answer your question um yes and brought up new ones okay good. Uh, <laughs> um yeah i from an early age, I was always told I had leadership abilities, you know, and then as a woman, you know, you hit 13 and I had sort of, I was in a very conventional household. My father was very great Santini-ish, you know, loved the military and everything. So I um, had sort of dark night of the soul or breakdown or whatever. So it was very eighth house stuff, you know, and now the thing is, is, um, Aries is inter an intercepted sign in my 12th house, and Mars in Aquarius isn't really, you know, a strong expression of Mars. So what I find is that even though I was a tomboy, and speaking of all these masculine qualities, that I have had trouble with initiation, with, um, you know, and I have a pi the Pisces Virgo nodal axis. I think maybe you, you said you had that, but, but so there's that you know, I feel there's a drag from past lives, you know, I feel that. So I don't know where I'm going with this, if it's a question, but just that um, it's interesting that there are strong masculine signatures, but I do, I feel like I have trouble with Aries. It's, it's an intercepted in my 12th house, you know, and I have trouble, I'm indecisive, you know, but I also have a T-square to Saturn in, in Libra, so, you know. Um, 
-hmm. You know, so I, you know, if, if it's really, if masculinity is really that Aries impulse, um, I think it's kind of watered down for me, you know, because with Mars and Aquarius, I don't like to argue. I like to see all sides of everything. And um, anyway. Thank you. Well, first, according to Porphyry House System, um, you do have Aries in the 12th, which speaks to what you're speaking about in many ways, but you actually have Leo and Aquarius are intercepted in the fourth oh. house, not Aries. Which house system is that? Um, Porphyry house system. Oh, okay. I guess I was uh, with an old chart that was... Yeah, different house systems might switch it differently. Um, tell me a little bit about, more about your father. Well, he's an Aries. <laughs> um, very much an Aries, a huge head. <laughs> and, um, you know, he came out of the Depression and, you know, was in World War II and he just took off like a rocket. I mean, he went to uh, college on the GI Bill and just, he was in the federal government, but he was so good with, you know, investments. I mean, he was just, he never stopped. Yeah, he, he just never stopped. And there was really not so much time for the rest of the family because he was just on his single-minded mission to make a lot of money and to accomplish stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and my sister actually has moon in Aries and she's very similar to him. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So let me speak to some context in your chart. You have Mars, as you mentioned, in Aquarius in the 10th house, and it rules your 12th house, Aries. So 10th house is going to speak very much to the father archetype in many ways, in many cases. And so you mentioned your father just going and wasn't available for his family. So there was a dissociation, a disconnect, Aquarius. And he wasn't present. He wasn't available. So your own conditioning relative to that Mars energy is it's not accessible to you. Right, so that your relationship to that impulse within yourself is there's a dissociation, there's a there's a a disconnect, and the way it was reflected in Father is Mars. He's using his energy towards something else entirely, and you know Aquarius in the tenth house can feel limited or disinterested in family, and there could be a karma there of having left family behind to Mars have my freedom and do and follow my destiny and not be bound by any shackles. So a big part of this is kind of connecting with that very energy of dissociation because I would say there would be um, clearly Mars and Aquarius in the 10th house is very ambitious. It has a drive. It has an oomph. It wants to build and create something and it is socially aware. But there's a dissociation, there's a trauma there that is about some sort of disconnection from that impulse to act and respond. So since Mars is about responding, right, how we respond to things instinctively, there might be, you know, value in just kind of looking at your past and noticing, because anything 10th house, a lot of times the healing that we do is we go back into the past first and we unravel our own conditioning. So you can liberate from this trauma that you've actually inherited from your own father and unraveling that. And let me just see what else comes up for me in this. I mean, yeah, I mean, also you got the sun, which you have a lot of father stuff in this chart. Saturn in the fifth house, sun squared in the nodes, you know, kind of shows up a lot here. Um, this definitely speaks to a lot of energy. All that sun, yeah, all that Sagittarius energy actually wants to be opened up. It wants to be claimed further. I don't know entirely what your path is right now, but from what you've shared, I definitely see that. There's, there's claiming your truth, claiming your power. Um, and relative to that Pisces in the 11th, it's, you know, you exist. <laughs> You're not just a fly on the wall. You have a purpose and a value, something to cultivate and grow and really, really trust and build into. Your Mars actually trying Saturn. So ultimately, there's a lot of skillfulness for you when it comes to building your work and following your directive in life. Just tell me a little, what are you, what, what is, what is your work or what is your passion? What calls to you? What, what, what is your oomph? Um, well, you know, I had all these disruptions in my career from a lot of trauma. Chiron is also conjunct my son and it's a skip step. So it's been a disjointed career, but it bounces through 
early on, it was like I've always written. I've always been a writer. Um, and, and I do have Uranus and Mercury and mutual reception. So I've always written. Um, but I had to drop out of school because of a trauma. So I bounced around to, I went to New York, and I then I became just a fashion buyer, sort of out of nowhere. <laughs> I worked at HBO, and I was a um, writer, producer. But behind all this, my, my greatest interest was always in metaphysics and in astrology. And, and, you know, I've sort of been coming back to that now that things have calmed down a little from... I've done what you said, a lot of unwinding of early trauma the past five or six years since my mother died in 2010. And she and my sister are both Pisces that are, my mother was the opposite of my father. So it was a completely, she was totally dependent on him. It was a completely, you know, imbalanced. So for me, finding sovereignty and that balance of masculine and female, feminine, I think is part of my path, you know, because in terms of right now, I have this group called Fire Sisters Rising. It is a sort of a sovereignty group for women, you know, finding that balance between masculine and feminine. So I think in the future, writing and probably more astrology in my golden years is probably where it's going to go. You know. Great. And in, in the fourth, um, Uranus is in the third house, which rules that, you know, that Aquarius. So that resonates very much as well. Yeah. So yeah, it's been an interesting journey, and um, um, you know what you said is 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 resonated about my father and the masculine and um, the Aries kind of missing with the dissociation. You know, so I really have been working hard on connecting to my body where I was traumatized and going through that whole sort of the I guess. Um, uh, well, it's interesting because my Pluto's in Leo, so the polarity point is Aquarius as well. Um, so anyway, I'll wind up, but a, a chiropractor recently said to me, the best way to heal your wounds is to serve other people. That's totally in your nature, so you need to just do that and not worry about digging out the wounds any longer. So. I like that. <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. That's a very chironic thing to, to say as well, right? It's <laughs> give yourself. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thank you for sharing, Patricia. Oh, Barbara. Sure. Thank okay. you. One more thing I'll say about that Mars is um, Mars in Aquarius, if there's trauma, it, it might have, it, there might be a numbness, like metaphorically. Um, it's like not getting excited or not getting turned on or not getting reactive, not getting angry, not getting passionate, right? And so a lot of times I see people with strong Mars in Aquarius are actually drawn to things like jumping out of airplanes or extreme sports that are just like, will take them far up, up, height, objectivity, clarity, seeing clearly, impersonal, not attached, but will also really like bring them into like their, the, the places of their fear, the places of where they're in the edge of their own comfort so they can feel there's like an extremity that can really manifest there. Um, and honest, when we take that into spirituality, um, becoming an observer, of everything, even becoming an observer of the numbness, even becoming an observer of the not, like there's, there's something about Mars and Aquarius of directing attention, single focus towards watching everything, but not letting that become dissociation from embodiment, which you were speaking of. Um, but it can actually bring profound liberation to, to see, and oftentimes there's projections or stories that are like, well, I don't want to get angry, I don't want to get involved, and to actually look at that something else unravels so often. Okay. I will say one, yes. one thing to that is that um, I was very passionate when I was younger and then I had this breakdown and then in college I had a samadhi experience but it was followed by a a thing with radiators where my well anyway my head and ears were numb for two yeah. decades like no one could figure out what was wrong so literally somatically I was numb and couldn't think clearly for about two decades so that's a pretty intense manifestation of you know what you're talking about yeah and, and i've yeah. You know, gone through sound healing shamanic stuff and now nervous system work to unwind the numbness so that's actually a literal 
you know, and, and I think earlier in my life, I threw myself into daring things because I didn't want to live a mediocre life with this numbness, you know? Mm -hmm. Right, I, right. Anyway, I had to get to the core of it, which I, I'm doing now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Some loud noises just happened. I hope you could hear me. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Sure. Great. Um, by the way, that happens a lot um, in, in the Kundalini process, I found, I find, is there often comes a point where there's like a physiology that persists and persists and persists, and it's like, and, and oftentimes headaches and things like that, and it's a very Aquarian phenomenon where energy is like stuck and it's not moving. We consciously don't even know how to, and a, a part of it is just like another layer of trauma that has yet to been released. So like we don't know when we're dissociated, when we're dissociated. Like when we're not embodied and we're walking around not embodied, not connecting to a part of ourselves that we've kind of hid away, we don't know that until we claim that part of ourselves. It's really interesting. Okay, let's go to the next chart. Wait, but second, I want to give attention to what Linda did here. Look at that beautiful imagery. Linda, I just want to honor you. you just put so much love and joy into just the creation of all these things that you're doing. And I just think that's amazing. And I, yeah, you're, you're a beautiful leader. And Thank you. Look at that. Look at that image. There's so much there. <laughs> okay. Carol. Yes. And by the way, everyone, I'm happy to stick around later. Um, yeah. Okay. Am I the last one for today? Um, no, you're not. Then you tell me when, when, uh, when should we stop? Another 15 minutes exactly, but, but okay. only if the volunteers can be brief in their answers. Okay, we'll see how it goes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Hi, Carol. Hi, Ari. So do you have a question? I do. There's okay. There's an inconjunct between my Mars and my North Node. Can you see that a little bit? Um, there is an inconjunct. Are you sure? Oh yeah, I'm looking at my chart here on my screen. 150 you, degrees, right? What's that? 150 degrees is an inconjunct. Yeah, but it's not 150 degrees. Are you Carol with a 29 degree Aquarius rising? That's me. Yep, it's not 150 degrees. It's a hundred and like whatever, more than that. <laughs> oh, it is. Ooh, yeah, yeah. There's an inconjunct. I mean, it's actually not even. It's a trine between your Pluto and your Mars. Right. And then it's um. Whatever's after you know, it's it's more than a trine. It's before an inconjunct. Actually, is is more accurate to say. Okay. But do you have do you have a question? No, about actually, that was it when I was just looking at the chart I have here. Okay. Home. I guess it's showing something different than yours. I, I got that incorrect. So I would always recommend, and this is a good, you know, Mercury lesson, not to look at the lines, but to actually count. Re, it's a good practice to actually get the visual uh, skill. So you have four degrees Taurus, and that's 120 degrees from any Earth sign. So 120 from Virgo right. plus, you know, 14. So it's 134 degrees. So a little bit shy of 150 then. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was it. You can go on to the next person so they'll have some time. Okay. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I'm noticing something here. Let me just do a calculation in my head for a second. Yeah. I think you were noticing something. Um, what's 90 plus 35 plus 45? 135, right? Yeah. yeah. So you have, a, you have a sesquiquadrate. Uh -huh. There we go. That's what it is. Not an inconjunct, but you have, um, yep. Um, almost like it's like the very end of, it's almost gibbous phase. It's the very end of the first quarter phase. Sesquiquadrate to the North Node in Mars. So that's good, I can speak to that. Let me just tune into your chart to get a feel for what this is about. 
actually forget that. Tell me a little bit about you and then I can speak to your chart. Oh, um, well, I don't want to waste too much time. It's a, there's no time wasted. It's all learning. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know. What do you want to know? <laughs> well, I guess if there's no question, we won't, we won't, we won't, we won't go anywhere. But if, you know, if, if I were to speak to your chart in the Sesqua Quadrant, I would want to have some context for your life. In general, the Sesqua Quadrant energy is where there can be excessiveness and a lot of yang energy that's actually being curved and refined towards greater attention towards detail. Oftentimes we learn through overdoing it and developing humility more attunement, more self-awareness, more self-knowledge. That 135 degree station is actually very meticulous. And our karma around that particular aspect is to become more aware of detail. Slow down, focus on what needs to be actually addressed. It's almost like if you're here, if you're um, you know, starting a fire, you know, second house Mars in Taurus, um, and you're cooperating with someone else, Virgo North Node in the seventh house, and you're both working together to survive. You have that impulse, Mars, to do basic survival needs, to take care of basic needs. This would be actually you know, saying, hey, do you uh, have a lighter? Or do you, did you learn how to do this? Because I might need help with this. Or um, did you want the, it's, it's checking in. It would be not just running instinctively and using this energy to act, but also not getting stuck in um, you know, too much headiness. And that's a general symbology with that gibbous face from 135 degrees to 180 degrees. But staying in motion, but having a connection with learning and adopting and adjusting with another person. And there could be a lot of lessons of like, oh, I just went overboard. You know, I just went too far or I wasn't asking or, or the other way around, things like that. Okay, We're doing too much. What's that? We're doing too much. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, Vir Virgo in the seventh house can definitely have an issue in general with, with overgiving, right? Like giving too much or not honoring oneself in the giving. Oh gosh, that is so true. And then that Mars and that Taurus energy is about this peace and staying grounded, staying centered and connected to your own self-worth, your own value. So not abandoning that while being in relationship with the outer. So we can go in either direction of maybe there's a guilt around having not acted with consideration towards other people, which then leads to excessive self-doubt in being overly meticulous and cautious, but then not really being in your body, second house Mars. Wow, got it. And that's just super general. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Carol. Oh, thank you, Ari. It's nice to meet you tonight. Okay, Irina. Yes, here I am. Hello. Hi. I'm going to find your image. Let's see. Yeah, do you have a question? Well, my Mars is pretty strongly positioned there, I find, because it's in, um, it's in Scorpio and it's conjunct to Uranus, and it's also very close to, it's conjunct to, almost conjunct with Venus. And I find that to be quite an interesting combination, especially when you spoke about um, directing this energy, but also learning how to be mindful of others as well. So, but I, I also feel that this energy has been blocked for many, many years, and I wonder if there's something in the chart that can kind of give me a clue how to direct it next. Speak to how it's been blocked. How has that been manifesting for you? Like, how are you experiencing that? Well, um, the the um, I can't seem to move forward. Every time I decide something in my life, it is only for a short time until it kind of exhausts itself. Except uh, communication. Now that is always always very has always been strong for me. Obviously, because it's third house, but everything else is in a stop uh, most of the part of my life uh, except very short breaks when I do get moving and then it gets stopped and I find it to be very strongly connected with Aries energy and I'm surrounded by Aries people who are showing me how it's done mm. and yet I can't seem to kind of I'm like what so it's interesting what are I want to wanna know why what's happening what here is something you're wanting to do that you're not able to do 
Um, well, I've um, always wanted to be the creative part. I'm, I've finished design. That was my occupation, but I went to freelancing and I want to be a creator of things that I kind of envision in my mind and then put it out, something that's completely new and not been seen before and just express myself in that way. But when I do it, it somehow doesn't get into the ground and then sprout out in a way. And I find it very confusing because the, the passion is there, but somehow it doesn't have the seed to, to, and the energy to get it you know, going. So what happens where it doesn't really get out of the ground? Like what's, what's the experience like? What happens? The experience is this very powerful sprouting moment. I feel it very strong. And I, I, at that moment, I feel it's going to last forever. And mm -hmm. then about like a year or two or maybe even three if I'm lucky, that I feel the energy being very, very um, exhausted, like tired. I can't seem to um, connect to the source of the same passion that started it three years ago. Great, let me tune into this for a moment. <clears throat> what, what's most clear for me is this is really a lesson in deep, deep self-value and self-trust. That yes, you're going in a certain direction, but then there's a present moment, which is what's calling to you now. And when you become identified with the way it originally was, you're not letting yourself evolve and grow with the energy. And so then that creates a stagnation where it's like you're trying to be the dead horse. And to see that it's like when the enthusiasm isn't there anymore, it's actually an invitation for breaking free from the past and taking it to the next level. Mm -hmm. You have Mars balsamic to Uranus, and it's all ruled by Pluto in the second house. Um, in general, those signatures, and you have that north node in the first house, Neptune squaring it. There's a lot of themes here that speak around in this lifetime, really claiming self trust, really giving yourself the permission to walk your path, claim your own mastery, claim your own power, your own leadership skills, but according to no one's definition. Mm -hmm. comparing yourself to how no one else does it. Even if it looks like you're never committing to something, it's not really about the thing. It's about the motion. It's Scorpio Mars with Uranus. It's you got to do what you got to do and give it all and then let it die when it's time to die. But there's something else that births from that. And this is your, in a way your evolution. It's not possessing. It's not holding on to, to any of that you're going to be you're going to be okay in letting go and then a deep or more relevant expression comes through and the way this is in terms of evolution it's keeping yourself in motion so that each level is even more essential you're accessing more of your core power you're connecting with something that's even deeper so you're learning to position yourself in a way where change isn't a destabilizing factor in a way where things, losing momentum, losing the interest, doesn't mean you're disconnecting from that yang energy of creation within you, that infinite power of your soul. This, this wants to be realized as my ability to act is rooted in an infinite freedom. Infinite freedom when your mind isn't bound by any particular conditions. So, you know, especially with that Neptune square in the nodes and Saturn as well, there would be a piece around and Virgo in the first house, trusting yourself, giving yourself that permission to really trust yourself and trust your authority. Does that make sense for you? It makes perfect sense. It's this, exactly kind of, this kind of signature, um, when you think about it in terms of evolution, it's about potent, full-on committed action, marriage, right? commitment and full on letting go in death so that you're free like to move from freedom is the piece here mm -hmm. instead of finding it to be like uh like i did before like a threat oh my god it's changing so that's not good yeah mm -hmm. yeah thank you so much you're welcome ari Moshe, we can go for another okay let's go for another 20 minutes because we're oh, we can to... yes we can because we're going to start the the last meeting later um, okay. So, thank you. Wonderful. Hey, Noah, are you here? Y yes, I'm here. All right. Hi, Ari. Yay. So nice to see you. And thank you so much for everything that you've presented so far. 
So brilliant. I love it. Yeah, I, uh, I don't necessarily have a question. I just, I've got a lot of Mars energy in my chart with Mars conjuncting my south node, uh, being exalted in, in Capricorn, squaring my moon. Um, I'm curious, I have my um, MC in Aries, so whatever insights you might have, and also you can speak about Mars conjuncting Black Moon Lilith in Capricorn. Okay. Curious your take on that. So, yeah, it's very clear. Um, right now, Uranus is moving towards your midheaven. Mm -hmm. um, let me just draw a little circle. How do I, how do I draw? Oh, whatever. Um, and that's ruled by Mars on the south node. I mean, just keeping it super, super simple, that orientation, Mars in the midheaven is action, 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 moving. And there's a need for autonomy and free will to define and create your own life, your own mastery in this world. And it's, there's an orientation towards work, cultivating yourself, Mars and Capricorn in the sixth house. And yet that same very signature can speak to being it's on the south node. And black moon Lilith is there as well. This can speak to very strong repression of your own power and your own autonomy via lifetimes of slavery and servitude or doing work. Or maybe you're a leader or you're in control of something, but within the context of some kind of de degrading atmosphere. So when you put this energy in this sixth house, you can bring up the psychology of inferiority or the psychology of not good enough. But then all this energy, well, I'm going to become an authority and succeed and do the best job that I can um, doing something that really is actually just a procrastination and a denial of my true, true calling in life. So there would be, being that it's all on the south node, there would be in your own journey an unraveling of coming into a deeply honoring and autonomous sense of this is my work. This is what I'm here to cultivate. This is what I'm going to invest all of my attention and my authority into that. When we look at this Mars Black Moon Lilith on the South Node without any kind of residual karma, it's thus manifesting as the ability to do a really good job serving and acting in a way that is relevant to your soul's purpose in this lifetime. The ability to do something, bring it to completion, and to fully commit yourself. There's a lot of humility and devotion and being a role model. Capricorn is a role model. 10th house is the role model. Um, so all of this energy right now, I don't know how much you want to talk about your own private life or not, but you're welcome to, to the extent that you want to. Um, but all this energy, of course, Saturn on your Mars and um, all this Aries energy squaring your Mars right now is, is putting you into a deep refinement of six house, showing up for what's the work in front of you right now. What is the terrain that you're cultivating? What is the path of mastery that you're building? Um, so yeah, you know, I know your life a little bit, so I don't know if you want to speak about it, but on what's happening on the journey, but I could always offer more insight when questions are asked to me, and I can really speak more, less abstractly and more directly. Yeah, absolutely. And super spot on with everything that is um, happening in my life. And you know a little bit about some, some details, but on just other topic of my life um, just with my career and my my work and my service here and I am very much in that place of okay what is it going to take to be who I'm here to be mm -hmm. and the maybe uncomfortable realities for me to face with with knowing what I'm here to, to do, what I'm here to, to carry and to share. Um, yeah, and in that space of devotion, for sure. I've, I'm finding myself um, not isolated right now, but not feeling very inclined to socialize or distract myself, finding myself being alone a lot of times and just really focused on what it is that I'm creating, what it is that I'm birthing and moving my career mm. forward um, despite of everything that took place in my life about six months ago. So yeah, what you said is, is very true. And especially with all the transits right now on my Mars and 
um, south node and I feel there's a, a karmic clearing that is happening, um, claiming my power back within myself first and foremost. Yeah, yeah. Well, as we know, the north node is, is cancer in the 12th. So the ultimate piece here is around this unconditional love, unconditional belonging, unconditional. I am fundamentally by life, by the present moment, cancer held. And cancer isn't like abstract. Cancer is like, no, the baby gets fed. It gets held. When you put the cancer in the 12th house, it's, it's like the entire cosmos are addressing the most intimate, vulnerable aspects of your own needs. Like no, no part is left unaddressed. That's like how unconditional and how true and how real and how aware this love is. You truly being at home. And in the 12th house, we surrender to the ultimate truth. Here it's the ultimate truth of your identity, cancer, who you really are. Then you become that. So your purpose is really being that agent of unconditional love. Moon ruling that in the third house, in Libra, with Pluto and also with Saturn. So you're communicating, you're, you're expressing something, you're articulating. It's the words that you speak and it's the way that you touch people with your mind, with your hands, with your perceptions. And that Venus is in the fourth house. Venus rules Libra back in that fourth house womb, deep presence. There's obviously, there's a, there's a gift that's being given. And what you spoke about in terms of feeling more inward, that makes a lot of sense here because that cancer in the 12th house isn't a doer. And so what you're doing is you're karmically reshaping your relationship to that Mars on the South node where the unresolved karma would be a perpetual, there's something undone. But to orient towards the action of doing, not from a place of there being something yet unresolved, is to completely clear that karma. But one thing I noticed about karma is it has a timing. I think I've said, I said this recently somewhere. Karma has a timing. Like, it started somewhere and it ends somewhere. <laughs> I, I've been finding this to be really, and sometimes the soul sets up stations to play it out and bring it to completion. So with all that on the South node, when there isn't a resonance, a latent resonance with, there is something inherently wrong or incomplete about now or about me, that means you're resting at home. Then all the doing comes from this place of, it, it's a different foundation. I couldn't even describe it. It's when, when, Anything Virgo or sixth house, when we're, when we're not um, motivated by something that feels unresolved inside of us, especially if Capricorn's involved, it can have a lot of guilt. It's beautiful. Like, it's such beautiful service. There's so much integrity. There's so much giving. It's just, it's so devotional. It's beautiful. It can do anything. It has so much energy because it's not wrapped up or lost in, in inadequacies. Um, do you want to ask or speak to any of this? Um, I'm, I feel complete. It's just, yeah, it resonates very deeply. Great. Yeah. Great to Thank see you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Patri. Hi, Ari. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Patricia. Patrick. Patricia. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I would like to know um, how to manifest my my Mars and Venus, since you see I have a stellium and, and Scorpio, the 12th house. Um, it just seems like I can grasp uh, the, the Mercury and Uranus uh, conjunction, but I, I just, it seems like I, I, and I know how the light and the shadow side of uh, Mars and Venus and Scorpio is, but I don't know how to manifest it in, in the 12th house. And it seems like I feel always very, very invisible mm. and very uh, unpowerful. I, I can't manifest what I want. You know what I mean? Yeah, I hear you. So let me take a moment and tune into your chart. Yeah, I mean, it really seems like your soul has chosen to, 
to kind of like n disconnect and totally abnegate and deny that that yang uh, aggressive impulse, which is very necessary for just you know having immune. Like if you don't, if that Mars energy isn't moving, if it's not quick enough, then like all these other things are like get on it. There's a yeah. thing like if you're like walking through a crowd, you have to walk quickly enough to get through the people but if you're slow then like you'll just get knocked over and that's you know you have neptune in sag squaring the nodes and that also is squaring saturn in, in the 10th house there's definitely a piece around guilt that your soul's okay. carrying around that masculine energy and then you have mars in the 12th house so um ruled by pluto in libra in this in the 11th we can definitely tend towards association so in the time that we have, I mean, what I would basically want to say is when I look at those signatures, there's a lot of power inherently, right? Like you don't lack the power, especially with that Saturn up there. It's you, your soul wants to create and build and establish something. And you have Leo on the midheaven too. This is not a soul that wants to remain hidden, but being hidden, not being engaged, not having energy, not being able to act or use your will. That's a part of the journey. And I would suggest that when that manifests sometimes there's you know pisces 12th house can have this indefinite indef indefinable quality of being in like a reality that is just sort of not mine i'm just coasting along i don't feel connected i don't really know who i am it's just sort of bleh and it can feel like it's going on forever where we don't really know where we are or who we are but that can shift in the snap of a finger. What I would want to offer to you is this is at the core in terms of you trusting your own spirituality, trusting the truth of this life and the truth of who you are. The story you have of I can't act and I can't assert, you know, it's, there's just the story of that, but there's a, there's a deeper possibility to explore that place of co-creation where you connect with your own dreams, you connect with your own inspiration. And you begin realizing that you get to choose. That's what I would say would be the missing piece for you. Just from what I'm seeing in your chart and sending, it's like there's a, there's a spaciousness and a permission to choose where you direct your attention because you know what you love. You know, you know yeah, what you're about. The thing is, it, it doesn't manifest. You know, I, I, I do um understand the archetypes of uh mars and libra and, and scorpio but it just it seems like <clears throat> everything that i want to start at projects um it really seems really ridiculous because it seems like somebody everybody somebody's reading my mind people read my mind <laughs> so like if i have a project that i, I want to open up a business like I don't know, six months later, like somebody opened it up and I'm like, oh my God, really? Or, um, uh, you know, all those psychic things that, that I, I tune a lot into that and with that Mercury and, and uh, Uranus, is my mind does not stop, not even sleep. And, and meditation um, is very difficult for me, which um, I'm finding a way to a little bit settle my mind also my with my moon in Gemini so you know it doesn't stop also um and I have a t-square to um to Neptune and uh Saturn with my moon um I think right I don't know if yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you have your grand cross really with the nodes in Saturn and, and Neptune yeah so, here's, so here's what I want to offer for you Patricia um two things come up from what you're speaking. Mm -hmm. At the core, you are realizing that you are supported. The universe supports you to fully live in your passion, in your beauty, in your gifts, and to live a meaningful life. What you're becoming aware of is how you do or do not take responsibility for your own vibration. You spoke about you have an inspiration, it's real, and then someone else does it six months later. To so that right there, that's the pivot point for you. Because indeed, anything you do from that place of inspiration, it's gonna be completely unique. It doesn't matter how many, how many amazing massage therapists are there. They're not like, oh, there's already 20 people in 
in this progressive town, everyone actually, how many astrologers are there? Everyone actualizes themselves, not because of, and that's the comparison that you're doing because of some kind of shame of maybe stepping over boundaries, right? Going overboard, doing what you really didn't know how to do. Or there, there's, there's a piece for you around a trusting your authority, but Virgo in the 10th house is, oh, that's not valuable or comparing yourself to what everyone else does. This is really about cultivating and developing a deeper trust in your spirituality. No one's going to validate the gift that you get to cultivate and find and really give to others is in this void of nothing in the outer reality, reflecting anything back to you that says yes. You get to ride forward only on your inspiration moment to moment. And the peace for you, and this is really deep in your chart, die for it. Because it's either that or you live a life of fear. So what you're doing is you're developing and building up the passion and the oomph of like, fuck it. Either I'm living or I'm just kind of like not living, <laughs> dying, however you want to think of it. But and that's, that's, that's basically how I feel. Like, I feel like I'm not living mm, because, you know, um, I, I, things don't manifest to me, for me with that Mars. It, I don't know how to make it manifest in any way. So I've heard you say things don't manifest probably three or four times, which yeah. means maybe the next step for you. And I don't want to tell you what to do, but I'm just reading your energy and working with you. But I can say all the things that I'm saying, but I recognize that there's a default for you to go to the, yeah, but things are manifesting. <laughs> I would want to suggest perhaps that maybe before the inspiration, trusting yourself piece, which will come, you allow yourself to grieve, right? You allow yourself to actually be where you are. Cause there's, there's an element of self judgment that I'm, that I'm witnessing of right? things don't manifest for me. That doesn't get you anywhere. But there's emotion there. There's something to feel. There's something to acknowledge. I would just want to give you so much more permission than you've been giving yourself to be where you are, to not hold a standard of success that you're not able to reach and then you're down about that. Time is on your side. Um, I just want to take a look at something here. And also it seems like... Uh, <laughs> ridiculously like very in a, in a ridiculous way uh, the few men that i tend to attract they're all uh, men that are just just not emotionally available it's like oh, ridiculous of course, of course. <laughs> and i know that's the scorpio but i mean but it's it's ridiculous right <laughs> It's just it manifests. It's manifesting, but it's in a, in a bad way. With that, I, I I don't know. I I've studied a little bit about um, um Venus in retrograde, which is a totally different energy of, of Venus in direct. One of the symbologies for you with this Venus retrograde is learning to become self-sufficient in your own inner relationship to spirit, where there's been an overemphasis around belonging and and lose literally losing your soul to other people in the past venus in the scorpio 12th house pluto in the seven in the 11th libra it's been overly outward that's a part of what this speaks to is your soul's really becoming venus self-reliant deeper connection deeper embodiment and spirit i i want to say one time on your side you have set you know all this capricorn aries energy soon to be locking on your pluto which will all that scorpio so it's this window right now really feels like a lot of you letting yourself connect more deeply to what's actually unfolding within you and unraveling the judgment. And that's what I want to say. It's like the, the, the experience of frustration and hurt and betrayal and abandonment and not being met and grief that's in you around life direction and relationship. I just want to honor that that's for you to really, really embody. Like you can, I forgot there was one word that you used when you were talking about the men in your life. Yeah, they're like emotionally unavailable. But there's a word that you use that describes how you feel about it. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> so that's what it's like. You said so, ridiculous. ridiculous. Ridiculous, yeah. I would want to invite you, and I'm doing this playfully with you, right? But I would want to invite you to let it be ridiculous. Like... <laughs> To actually let but I can. Out. I mean, my, my Scorpio 
uh, all that Scorpio there. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm not a person. You know, I'm very intense in love and 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 really not with anyone love. else but yourself. Let it be ridiculous to God. Fucking say this fucking sucks. Like let it out. <laughs> I and, do, and, I do. <laughs> right? Because what I, I'm just witnessing you and, and where I see you tend to gravitate, at least right now, I'm sure we have different moments, is it's a dissociation where it's almost like a numbness or a letdown or a disconnect. Like a Scorpio jadedness, right? <sighs> jadedness is just one moment in time. You don't have to stay there. But beyond that is like everything that you're feeling, oh my God, everything that you're feeling I, I would, in Scorpio, what's interesting about Scorpio, you have Mars and Venus in Scorpio, so you speak about the, the, them not sticking around or not wanting to commit. The hard truth is commit to yourself. And it doesn't have to be like an idea of what that looks like. It's simply like be with your soul, like be with the depth of your own being. That, by the way, is where you'll unlock all that passion. Like there's anger, there's aggression, there's rage, there's hurt, there's all kinds of beautiful energies in there. And it can feel sloppy, but it's the twelfth house, so the whole ocean of life supports you in this, right? Um, but when you try to make it about the external, you're gonna get frustrated. You're gonna be let down over and over and over again until you finally get this truth. Yeah, it feels like that, like um, that Neptune in the first house. It's just it makes me feel or see things uh, more optimistic <laughs> than. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we have to wind down now thanks yes, my, okay well, well i'll wind down thank you so much patricia thank and you I'll just say, nothing the chart the way i look at the chart is no yeah. signatures make us it's all reflecting our own consciousness um and heck you know neptune and sag in the first house it's a it's an optimism to you it's basically there's a part of you that knows underneath it all there's a path that you're walking and to draw upon that, that gives you the faith and the motivation to go through the darkness, which yeah. is necessary, which I already, it's necessary, but that gives you the, the stamina. Okay, yeah. thank you for sharing yourself, Patricia. Thank you, everyone, so much. Let me stop the share. Thank you. Could you stop share? Beautiful. Yes, okay. I just stopped shared. So I think you should be able to see my face now. Is that correct? Yes, we can see yes. you. We can see okay. everybody. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you, everyone, for joining me on this journey today. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Mercury Retrograde Bye. journey. Much Bye. love to you all. Bye. Bye. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Excellent. Linda. See you at Tashi's meeting next. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.